You are listening to Hope and Healing, a resource of Macon FBC. Tune in each week as we release a message from God's Word that will bring the hope and healing of Jesus Christ to your soul. It is the Word of God that restores the soul, that makes wise the simple, that rejoices the heart, and that energizes our life. It is the Word of God that pierces to the deepest, darkest corners of our troubled hearts in order to bring the soothing warmth of Christ's healing power. We hope that you will be encouraged and equipped to follow Jesus as you experience the hope and healing of Christ with us. In this nine-week series, Pastor Phil Bray applies Exodus 25-31 through to our lives, showing us how to live in communion with God. This section of Scripture explores how to live in the presence of God and experience the joy and peace of His never-ending love. to open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 28. Exodus chapter 28, we're actually going to look at Exodus 28 and 29. If you are a guest with us this morning or your first time tuning in to make an FBC, we want to welcome you, uh, but also give you uh, kind of an idea of what we're doing. Uh, We believe that the whole Bible is God's word. Every word, every passage, every verse is inspired and breathed out by God, authored by God through his human instruments. And we believe that every word is profitable uh, and purposeful. He has put these words and these passages and these descriptions in here for our good and his glory. And we want to understand and do what God commands. And so we've been studying the book of Exodus for quite some time. And this is a portion of scripture that if you read through your Bible, you tend to get to, uh, you know, late January, early February uh, in your Bible reading plan. And it, this is a part where it gets kind of hard because a lot of detail that seems to be so irrelevant, but there is much theology here that I think can help us grow in our faith. And so we're going to read this text together this morning, and I want you to listen for repetition. I want you to listen for words and phrases that are said over and over again. Those are keys to what the author is trying to teach us with this passage. I want you to listen um, for patterns and and things that are repeated uh, as we read through this together and for purpose statements. Why is he giving us this? Why is he saying this? And I think that will help you understand the text. So Exodus chapter 28, verse one. Then bring near to to yourself Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the sons of Israel to minister as priest to me, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. And you shall speak to, the skillful, to all the skillful persons whom I have endowed with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister as priest to me. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastpiece and an ephod, and a robe, and a tunic of checkered work, a turban, and a sash, and they shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother and his sons, that he may minister as priest to me. And they shall take gold and blue, and the purple, and the scarlet material, and the fine linen. They shall also make the ephod of gold, of blue, and purple, and scarlet material, and fine twisted linen, the work of skillful workmen. It shall have two shoulder pieces joined to its two ends, that it may be joined." And the skillfully woven band which is on it shall be like its workmanship of the same material of gold, of blue, of purple, and scarlet material, and fine twisted linen. And you shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on the one stone, and the names of the remaining six on the other stone, according to their birth. As a jeweler engraves a signet, you shall engrave the two stones according to the names of the sons of Israel. You shall set them in filigree settings of gold, and you shall put the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as stones of memorial for the sons of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before Yahweh on his two shoulders for a memorial. And you shall make filigree settings of gold and two chains of pure gold. You shall make them of twisted cordage work and you shall put the corded chains on the filigree settings. 
and you shall make a breastpiece of judgment, the work of skillful workmen, like the work of an ephod, you shall make it of gold, of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen, you shall make it. It shall be a square and fold double, a span in length and a span in width. You shall mount on the four rows of stones. The first row shall be a row of ruby, topaz and emerald, and the second row of turquoise, a sapphire and a diamond, and the third row a jackneath and an agate and an amethyst, and the fourth row a beryl and an onyx and a jasper, they shall be set in gold filigree. And the stone shall be according to the names of the sons of Israel, twelve according to their names. They shall be like the engravings of a seal, each according to his name for the twelve tribes. And you shall make on the breastpiece chains of twisted cordage work in pure gold. And you shall make on the breastpiece two rings of gold and shall put on, excuse me, and put the two rings on the two ends of the breastpiece. And you shall put the two cords of gold on the two rings at the ends of the breastpiece. And you shall put the other two ends of the two cords on the two filigree settings and put them on the, two, on the shoulder pieces of the ephod at the front of it. And you shall make two rings of gold and shall place them on the two ends of the breastpiece on the edge of it, which is toward the inner side of the ephod. And you shall make two rings of gold and put them on the bottom of the two shoulder pieces of the ephod, on the front close to the place where it is joined, above the skillfully woven band of the ephod, and they shall bind the breastpiece and its, by its rings to the rings of the ephod with a blue cord, that it may be skillfully woven band of the ephod, and the breastpiece may not come loose from the ephod. And Aaron shall carry the names of the sons of Israel in the breastpiece of judgment over his heart when he enters the holy place for a memorial before Yahweh continually. And you shall put in the breastpiece of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart while he goes in before Yahweh. And Aaron shall carry the judgment of the sons of Israel over his heart before Yahweh continually. And you shall make the robe of the ephod all of blue. And there shall be an opening at its top in the middle of it. Around its opening there shall be a binding of woven work as it were the opening of a coat of mail that it may not be torn. And you shall make on it on the hem pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet material. And around its hem and the bells of gold between them all around. A golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate, all around on the hem of the robe. And it shall be on Aaron when he ministers, and its tinkling may be heard when he enters and leaves the holy place before Yahweh, that he may not die. You shall also make a plate of pure gold, and shall engrave on it, like the engravings of a seal, holy to Yahweh." And you shall fasten it on a blue cord, and it shall be on the turban, and it shall be at the front of the turban, and it shall be on Aaron's forehead, and Aaron shall take away the iniquity of the holy things which the sons of Israel consecrate with regard to all their holy gifts, and it shall be always on his forehead that they may be accepted before Yahweh. And you shall weave the turban of checkered work of fine linen and shall make a turban of fine linen and you shall make a sash, the work of a weaver. And for Aaron's sons, you shall make tunics. You shall also make sashes for them and you shall also make caps for them for glory and for beauty. And you shall put them on Aaron your brother and on his sons with him and you shall anoint him and ordain them and consecrate them that they may serve me as priests." You shall make for them linen breeches to cover their bare flesh. They shall reach from their loins even to the thighs. And they shall be on Aaron and his sons when they enter the tent of meeting or when they approach the altar to minister in the holy place so that they do not incur guilt and die. It shall be a statute forever to him and to his descendants after him. Now this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them to minister as priests to me. Take one young bull and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread, and unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers spread with oil, and you shall make them of fine wheat flour. You shall put them in one basket and present them, excuse me, and present the basket along with the bull and the two rams. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the doorway of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. You shall take garments and put on Aaron the tunic and the robe and the ephod and the ephod and the breastpiece and gird him with skillfully woven band of the ephod. And you shall set the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. Then you shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. And you shall bring his sons and put tunics on them and you shall gird them with sashes, Aaron and his sons, and bind caps on them and they shall have the priesthood by perpetual statute 
So you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. Then you shall bring the bull before the tent of meeting, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the bull, and you shall slaughter the bull before Yahweh at the doorway of the tent of meeting. And you shall take some of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger, and you shall pour out the blood at the base of the altar. And you shall take the fat that covers the entrails and the lobe of the liver and two kidneys and the fat that is on them and offer them up in smoke on the altar. But the flesh of the bull and its hide and its refuse you shall burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. You shall also take one ram, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram. And you shall slaughter the ram, and you shall bring its blood and sprinkle it around the altar. <clears throat> then you shall cut the ram in its pe- into pieces and wash its entrails and its legs and put them with its pieces and its head. And you shall offer up in smoke the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to Yahweh. It is a soothing aroma, an offering by fire to Yahweh. Then you shall take the other ram, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram. And you shall slaughter the ram and take some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron right ear and on the lobes of his son's right ears and on the thumbs of their right hands and on the big toes of their right feet and sprinkle the rest of the blood around the altar. Then you should take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and his garments and on his sons and on his son's garments with him so, his, he, so he and his garments shall be consecrated as well as with his sons and his sons' garments with him. You shall also take the fat of the ram and the fat tail and the fat that covers the entrails and the lobe of the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them and the right thigh, for it is a ram of ordination. And one cake of bread and one cake of of bread mixed with oil and one wafer from the basket of unleavened bread which is set before Yahweh. And you shall put all these in the hands of Aaron and in the hands of his son and they shall wave them as a wave offering before Yahweh. And you shall take them from their hands and offer them up in smoke on the altar of burnt offering for a soothing aroma before Yahweh. It is an offering by fire to Yahweh. Then you shall take the the breast of Aaron's ram of ordination and wave it as a wave offering before Yahweh, and it shall be your portion. And you shall consecrate the breast of the wave offering and the thigh of the heave offering, which was waved and which was offered from the ram of ordination, from the one which was for Aaron and from the one which was for his sons. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons as their portion forever from the sons of Israel, for it is a heave offering, and and it shall be a heave offering from the sons of Israel, from the sacrifices of their peace offerings, even their heave offering to Yahweh. And the holy garments of Aaron shall be for his sons after him, that in them they may be anointed and ordained. For seven days, the one of his sons, who is priest in the stead, shall put them on when he enters the tent of meeting to minister in the holy place. And you shall make the ram of ordination and boil its flesh in the holy place. And Aaron and his sons shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Thus they shall eat those things by which atonement was made at their ordination and consecration. But a layman shall not eat them because they are holy. And if any of the flesh of the ordination or any of the bread remains until morning, then you shall burn the remainder with fire. It shall not be eaten because it is holy. And you shall do to Aaron and his sons according to all that I've commanded you. You shall ordain them through seven days. And each day you shall offer a bull as a sin offering for atonement. And you shall purify the altar when you make atonement for it. And you shall anoint it to consecrate it. For seven days you shall make atonement for the altar and consecrate it. Then the altar shall be most holy. And whatever touches the altar shall be holy. Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two one-year-old lambs each day, continuously. The one lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. And there shall be one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with a one-fourth of a hen of beaten oil and one-fourth of a hen of wine for a libation with one lamb. And the other lamb you shall offer at twilight, and shall offer it with the same grain offering as the morning and the same libation for a soothing aroma an offering by fire to Yahweh. It shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the doorway of the tent of meeting before Yahweh where I will meet with you to speak to you there. And I will meet there with the sons of Israel and it shall be consecrated by my glory. And I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. And I will also consecrate Aaron and his sons to minister as priest to me. And I will dwell among the sons of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am Yahweh their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt. 
that I may dwell among them. I am Yahweh, their God. Let's pray. Father, in faith, we read this long portion of Scripture because we know that it is your word, that you spoke it many thousands of years ago to Moses on Mount Sinai. And Moses recounted these words to the Israelites and subsequent generations of Israelites have heard these words read to them. And now we hear these words read to us and we want to know what they mean and we want to know how it applies to us who have been saved by your grace in Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, we know that Jesus is the fulfillment of the tabernacle. We know that he is God among us. In him, the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. We know that we are ourselves being built up into a holy dwelling place for you. That we, the body of Christ, are the temple of the living God. And we know that like Israel of old, you have called us to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So Lord, as we look at this text about priests, I pray that you would open our eyes to see what it means to dwell in your presence as priests of the Most High God. I pray that we would understand these words that we would see the relevance for our own lives and that we would leave this place eager to do what your word commands. I pray that we would be attracted to your holiness and repulsed by our sin. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God saved us to dwell among us, to live with us, to know us, to love us, to lavish his kindness upon us for all of eternity. That's what this text is saying. When we come to the very end of that long passage of scripture, at the end of chapter 29, did you hear what he said? You have to remember that Moses is still on Mount Sinai. Moses is still in the cloud, in the presence of the Lord, and God is speaking to Moses and describing to him what the tabernacle is to look like and how it is to function. It is to be God's dwelling place among Israel. It is to be a movable Mount Sinai for Israel to live in the presence of God. And part of that is the priesthood. But all of these instructions and all of these specifications Come to verse 43, and he says, there, I will meet with the sons of Israel, and it shall be consecrated by my glory, and I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. I will consecrate Aaron and his sons to minister as priests to me. All of this is wrapped up together. Dwelling with God in this sacred space as holy people set apart, different from everyone else. I will dwell among the sons of Israel and I will be their God and they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt that I might dwell among them. The whole purpose in salvation is that God would be with us. Does that not stagger you? God loves us beyond anything we can wrap our minds around. His love is as wide and deep as the ocean is. And he delights in us. And he calls us to delight in him because he knows that he is the greatest of all joys. And he knows that our hearts are prone to fixate on the creation that he has made to be enjoyed. And we begin to worship that and treasure that instead of God. And so God turns our hearts back towards him. John Piper says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. God is most valued and treasured and loved and worshiped by us when our hearts are most satisfied and at peace and content in him. When God is our greatest treasure, he is glorified as the greatest and most wonderful being in existence. 
God saved us that we might know him, that we might be near him, that he might continue to lavish his love and his kindness upon us for all eternity. Yet I don't know that we believe it. We believe it, but we don't believe it. We believe the words, but our lives often point to a different belief. If we truly loved God as this greatest and most wonderful treasure, the source of all pleasure and joy, the end to which we were created and formed, we would love him. We would delight in him. We would not be distracted from him by the trinkets of this world. If we possessed in our hands a golden encased ruby of immense size and worth, we would not be distracted by the baubles that you can pull out of the vending machine in the Walmart vestibule. But the fact that we keep going back and popping our quarters into that vending machine shows that we do not value or see God as he truly is. Do we love him? To love God is not to simply say, I love you, Lord, because I feel a a warm feeling pulsating through my heart right now. That's a part of love, but that's not what God describes as love. Love. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And we read that and we think, well, that means that that if we love God, then in duty, we will be faithful to God. But if a husband and wife love each other, it means that they are faithful to each other. And they do not view that faithfulness to each other as a duty and a drudgery. They view it as the one in whom my soul delights. I don't want anyone else. I want you. That's what love is. It is fidelity. It is faithfulness. It is commitment. It is loyalty. Not from duty, but from sheer delight and joy. That's what love is. That's why Jesus says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. You will be loyal to me because you are attracted to me. You will want to be like me. You will want to be near me. And sin is what separates you from me. Holiness is not something that we should view as repugnant, as a necessary evil to being close to God. No, holiness should be that thing that attracts us and delights us because that is us being near God. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 2, chapter 2, verse 4, he says, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected or completed. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought to himself walk in the same manner as he walked. If you are in Christ, if you love Christ, if you know Christ, it means you are attracted to the way of Christ and the words of Christ and the holiness of Christ and you want your life to be like Christ. But when we walk in the way of the world, it shows that we love the world. Loving God is desiring to dwell with God, to be with God, to abide with God, And that is evidenced in a life of holiness because God is holy. Hebrews 12, 14 says that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Matthew chapter 5, 8 says that the pure in heart will see God. Why am I saying all of this? Because God is holy. And that holiness is, is a part of what is so wonderful and good and pleasurable and joyful and peaceful and desirable about God. So holiness should attract us to God, not turn us away from God. We long to be holy because our God is holy. We long to be cleaned of all that defiles us because we want to be near God. We don't want to be separated from Him. We long to live in a way that enables us to be near Him unhindered. We long to be like Him. Holiness is not the burden of the Christian life. It is the delight and joy of the Christian life. And as we unpack these two chapters this morning, I want you to see something. I want you to see that these priests are the visible representations of the people who dwell in the presence of God. 
You see, this passage explains three facts about Old Testament priests in order to show us how to dwell in the presence of God. They were men, these men were a walking picture, a visual example of holiness. It was reflected in every aspect of their work. If you look at Exodus chapter 19, do you remember what God said to the nation? Look at Exodus 19, verse 4. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. If you enter into relationship with me, you will be a kingdom comprised of priests, people who dwell in the very presence of the living God of heaven and earth. But Israel didn't walk with God, did they? Like Adam before them, they chose sin and the things of this world and were banished from the presence of God. The exile was very much like Adam and Eve being removed from the Garden of Eden. Israel was removed from the land of promise. They were removed from the presence of God. Leviticus 20 tells us about this. They were exiled and the land vomited them out. But Jesus comes and he succeeds where Adam and Israel failed. He overcomes temptation and he creates a new humanity through his death and resurrection. And now, listen to the words in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Listen to the words of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you, talking about us, believers, regardless of ethnicity, you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You are the holy people of God. We've been redeemed by Christ. We've been forgiven through Christ and we've been transformed into this new humanity, this chosen race, this royal priesthood, a people who dwell in the presence of God as those who treasure and delight in God above all things. Now I say all of that to get us back to this text. That's who we are. We are priests. We are the people who dwell in in close proximity to God. And these Old Testament priests show us what that looks like. That's what this passage is about. So we're gonna look at three facts about these Old Testament priests in order to know what it looks like to dwell in the presence of God. Number one, as priests to God, we are clothed in the glory and beauty of Christ. As priests to God, we are clothed in the glory and the beauty of Christ. What do I mean? Well, this first chapter, again, is very heavy on detail regarding the design and the make of these priestly garments. And I don't think the point is for us to recreate these garments. I'd asked Patty originally to try and find a picture, a video like she did of the tabernacle to kind of give us a visual image, but I, I, I don't think that's the point. I think the point is, is more significant than that. Look at verse 2. And then look at verse 40. He says, And you shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother for glory and for beauty. Now look at verse 40. And you shall, and for Aaron's sons, you shall make tunics and also make sashes for them, and you shall make caps for them for glory and beauty. And for beauty. At the beginning of this long section about the description of the priest's garments, and at the end of it, the two bookends is the statement these garments are for glory and for beauty. Why does God want these garments? To reflect his glory, his greatness, his splendor, and his absolute beauty. That's what they're for. The priests were to be walking images of the glory and beauty of God. Their garments were to reflect his splendor, his wonder, his perfection, his richness, his beauty, his glory. In in Isaiah 6, verse 3, it says that that Isaiah sees the vision of God on his throne and the angels are singing, God is holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is filled with his glory. 
The whole earth is filled with the weight of his wonderfulness, his splendor, his greatness, his perfection, his goodness. And these garments are meant to reflect that reality. But secondly, look at what the garments are made of. Did you hear the repetition of the, of the materials? The gold, the finely twisted linen that's blue and purple and scarlet, it's, it's referred to over and over and over again. And those are the same materials and the same description that the tent itself is made of. These men are part of the tabernacle. They're clothed in the same raiment that the tabernacle itself is made of. What's the point of all that? There's a lot of, there is a lot of intersection here at the tabernacle. In the Garden of Eden, you have the description of this palace garden, this temple garden where God dwells with Adam and Eve. There's no sin. Everything is glorious. Everything is beautiful. Everything is perfect. Everything is whole. And the gold in that land is very good. The onyx stones in that land are filled. It's a, it's a land of richness. It's a land of beautiful trees and fruits and all of those things. When you go to New Jerusalem at the end of the age, you see the same kinds of descriptions. It's a place of richness and beauty. It's a place where the streets are paved with gold. It's a place in which the foundation stones of the temple or the city are all of these onyx stones and diamonds and jasper stones and all of this stuff. There's a, the, the point is connection. And this city is described as the wife of the lamb. We know the wife of the lamb is the church herself. What's the point of all this? All of these themes are flowing together. Just like last week, we understood that the tabernacle is a picture of us, the church, who are now the tabernacle of the living God. God dwells among us by his spirit. So these priests who are part of the tabernacle are, are now showing us what does it look like for God's people to dwell in his presence. We are to be people who reflect his beauty, his glory, his holiness, his compassion, his greatness, his love, his goodness, his righteousness, his kindness, his mercy. We are to be a people whose lives reflect the God whom we dwell with. If you remember the story of Moses when he came down from the mountain, his faith shone reflected the light of the glory of God. Our lives are to reflect that same glory. That's the point. In Matthew chapter 5, 16, he says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. When they see your good works, they're seeing God in you. Do you see what I'm saying? They're seeing the character and the nature and the wonder and the beauty and the attractiveness of God. Your holiness, your obedience to God is what makes the gospel attractive to the world. Now, what does, what does that then mean? How, how does that work? Look at with me at Galatians chapter three. Galatians chapter three. Look at verse 27. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If we have been saved, we are dressed in Christ, like the song we sang, dressed in his righteousness alone. We are clothed and covered with Christ. Christ is, these, is the priestly garments. His righteousness, his perfection is what enables us to be consecrated so as to stand in the presence of a holy God. God is not calling us to be holy, to be obedient in order to gain access to the tent. He has clothed us with Christ and given us access to the tent. Now our desire is to be like Christ, to fill out Christ, so to speak, in our own lives. 
Christ is our righteousness. Christ is our perfection. Christ is our holiness. Our identity is Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Thus, our life is to be a living, breathing, visible image of the invisible God as those who are clothed with Christ, who is the image of the invisible God. That's why he says in Romans 8, 29, that we are to be conformed. He's, he's predestined us to be conformed to the image of Christ. So how do we do that? Okay, so I, 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 again, I'm not trying to, there's, there's a whole lot of scripture that we need to kind of understand together in order to see what this Old Testament text is saying to us, but the reality is these priests would adorn themselves with these garments that were specifically identified with the glory and the beauty and the splendor of God in order that as they walked through life, they reflected God. They, 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 they were the image bearers of God. The average Israelite could look at these men and understand what God was like. Their garments were to help them do that. But now we understand that these garments are pointing to a new reality, the reality of Christ. But how is it that Christ then is seen in our lives? How do we put on Christ, so to speak? Look at Colossians chapter 3. Look at Colossians chapter 3. In verses 1 through 4, he says, You've been raised up with Christ, therefore keep seeking the, the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand. Your life is, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. So there you see this, this, this interplay that you are clothed with Christ. He is your life. You've become one with Christ. So that what is true of Christ is now true of you. Now look at what he says in verse 5. Therefore, because that's true, because you've been clothed and covered up and identified with Christ, therefore, consider or think... The members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is on account of these things that the wrath of God will come. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside. It's the language of taking off. Take them off. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. Don't lie to one another. Since you have laid aside the old self, you've taken off the old garments and the old way of living that reflects the selfishness and the rebellion of this world and have put on, you've clothed yourself with with the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. And as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on, you see it's the same language, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Do you see what he's saying? We, as the priests of God, are consecrated by Christ We are to be clothed with the glory and the beauty of God which is fully manifest in Jesus Christ. So how is it that we are, how how is it that the beauty and glory of Jesus is seen in us? What are the garments that people see when this world looks at us? How is it that they see Jesus? They see Jesus by seeing our garments in the same way that the Old Testament Israelites saw the glory of God's majesty by looking at the garments of these priests. So when the world looks at us, when Macon looks at us, they should see the glory, the beauty, the splendor, the perfection, the holiness, the goodness, the love, the mercy, the compassion, the kindness of Jesus in our lives. The being a priest of God, being one who dwells in the presence of God, means that we are clothed and wrapped up in holiness, which is the glory and splendor of Jesus. So when you look at your life, do you see Jesus? 
Or do you see the world? Have you taken off immorality? Or does it still clothe you? Have you taken off impurity and greed? Or does it still define you? When people look at your life, do they see someone who lives with open hands and gives what God has given away freely? Or do they see one who is accumulating stuff as much as everybody else in the world because our identity and our our joy is wrapped up not in Jesus, but in stuff? That's what the text is saying. Have you put off anger and wrath and malice and slander and abusive speech? When people see your posts on social media, do they see what the world, or do they see Jesus? Do they see the anger and the vitriol and the, 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 the spewing of venom that comes out? Or do they see Jesus' gracious kindness, speaking truth in love? You lay off the old and put on the new. There's no nakedness here. You're one or the other. Have you put on the new self? Now again, I want you to understand something very important. Look at verse 10. You've put on the new self who is being renewed. So this this putting on of Jesus, so to speak, this putting on of Christ's likeness, so to speak, is a lifelong process. God continually is revealing to us there is a garment here that needs to be taken off and thrown away. In our house, Stephanie is the sock Nazi. A sock that is still has 90% of material still functions as a sock for everyone in the house except for Stephanie. If it has a minute little hole in it, it's got to go in the trash can and then we have no socks but she thinks the socks need to be whole. And if it's not whole, it is to be taken off and thrown away. And it is to be replaced with a whole sock. God is constantly seeing our holy garments, not holy in Christ-likeness, but our imperfect, our non-Christ-likeness. And he is saying, you know what? You've been entertaining yourself with this show that it is ungodly and you've been justifying the wickedness that you've been entertaining yourself with as if this is normal and you're not participating in it and you're, 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 it's not really affecting you. You're watching it for the story. and No, you, you realize you, you've got to take that off and you've got to stop entertaining yourself with the world's rebellion against God. And so you... You find something else that is edifying and glorifying to God. You say, well, Pastor Phil, there's precious little. I, yeah, there is. So you sacrifice and you don't watch that stuff. Or God reveals to you that this attitude and this demeanor of your heart is, you're always angry. You have a, a short fuse and it just takes so little to set you off. God reveals that to you and you take it off and you put on patience and you put on kindness. But you know what happens? You, you keep putting on the, the anger. It keeps coming back. It's like, it's like a whack-a-mole, you know what I mean? It just keeps popping back up and you gotta keep whacking it back down. This is what he's saying here. This, this work of putting off and putting on is something that happens throughout your life. You are to be continually renewed into the image of Christ so that the older you get, the longer that you live as a Christian, you should look more like Jesus than you did at the beginning. Holiness is Christ-likeness. Holiness is reflecting the glory and the beauty and the splendor of God in our compassion, in our kindness, in our humility, in our gentleness, in our patience, in our willingness to forgive one another over and over again. It's in our sharing with one another. It's in our serving one another, in our sacrifice for one another. It's in our thankfulness, in our dwelling with peace with one another. Look, Look, 
look at Exodus chapter 34. Look at Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. God reveals himself to Moses. Moses says, Lord, show me your glory. I want to see your glory. I want to see your splendor. I want to see your greatness. I want to see it with my eyes. I, I want to I know you in every possible way. And, and God says, you know what, Moses? He says, you, you, I, will, I will make my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim my name of Yahweh before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show compassion to whom I will show compassion, but you can't see my face. It's too much for you. Die. Moses, Moses says, Lord, I, I want to see, and so he, he brings him part of the mountain, and he puts Moses into a cleft of the rock, and he covers Moses with his hand, and he passes by, and he allows Moses to see the afterglow. He allows Moses to see the 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 the. the the glory diminished some so that it's not lethal for him. But notice what that glory, how is that glory described? What does the glory of God look like? Verse six of chapter 34. Then Yahweh passed by in front of him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. And Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and worship. The glory of God is seen in the character of God. Do you see what I'm saying? So the glory of God is seen by this community in us when we reflect the character of God. When we are gracious and compassionate and patient and slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Don't you see that this matters so much more than our typical understanding of Christianity? It's not about attending an event once a week. It's about living before the face of God who dwells within us as holy people. Christianity is not summed up in how many church services you attend. Do you remember what James said? True religion in the sight of God is to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. To keep your garments looking like Jesus to keep your attitude and your heart and your life and your behavior like God. What needs to change in your life? Where are you reflecting the world instead of Christ? How should you repent and change today? We're not going to go on to the next two points. I'm way out of time already. There's no way, unless you want to be here till 1230. So, <laughs> thanks, Tom. So, I do want you, I, I, I want you to just, so we're almost done, so you can stop panicking and just think for just a minute with me. I don't want you leaving here discouraged and beating yourself up like, I'm a horrible person. I don't look anything like Jesus. If that's how you're feeling right now, if you're feeling conviction right now because of something, that's good. That's the spirit of the living God taking his word and applying it to your heart so that you can put off and put on. He doesn't leave you in ignorance. He reveals himself day after day after day so that you can draw ever closer to God. Do you not see that it's grace? So so repent. Repentance is the putting off. It's the verbalizing to God. It's the confessing to God. This is what I've been doing. This is what I've been watching. This is how I've been living. This is what I've been, I've been sexually immoral. I've been angry. I've been greedy. I've been, you fill in the blank. Lord, you know it because you know all things, but I I have been doing what is wicked in your sight. My life looks more like the world than it looks like Jesus. God, please forgive me. And God says, yes, I already paid for your sin in Jesus. Now put on Christ. Put on faithfulness. Put on holiness. Draw near to me, my child. And I draw near to you. How do you need to respond? Part of what it means to live in the presence of God. This is what this tabernacle stuff is all about. 
is to wear the garments that reflect the glory and the beauty of our King. And those garments are Christ. And those garments are our lives. Do you reflect the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Now maybe you're sitting here this morning and you realize you're not saved. You, 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 there's, there's not been a point where you have trusted in Jesus, where you, have, where you have laid your life down before him and said, I am not mine, I am yours. Please forgive my sin. I will follow you as Lord. You've never done that. And I encourage you to come Talk to me, talk to Pastor Sam. We'll be standing, one of us at the front, one of us at the back during the song of response. And you can come talk to us during that song. You can talk to us after the service is over. Or you can talk to the person that invited you to church. They will be happy to share Christ with you. But please don't leave. Because you can't clothe yourself with holiness without Jesus. Do you see what I'm saying? Your garments are Christ. You must be clothed with Christ. And the only way that that happens is to be baptized into Christ. It is to to become one with Christ through faith in his death and resurrection. And when that happens, then you can begin to put on the garments of a changed life. So come to Christ and be saved. This is Hope and Healing, a resource by Macon FBC. We hope you enjoyed this message and pray that it brought hope and healing to your heart. For more resources like this, visit HopeForMacon.com. I'm your host, Chris Stoner. Thank you for listening.